You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Coming up. Fresh calls for a windfall tax on oil and gas giants as BP announces record profits. India's power grid buckles under the strain of an historic heat wave. How can the region adapt to the new normal? And how strapping face masks to cows might help reduce the most potent greenhouse gas emissions. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world, hear from the people being hit hardest by those changes and report on the race for solutions. Now, there are mounting calls today for a windfall tax on energy company profits to help alleviate the cost of living crisis. Soaring oil and gas prices saw BP profits nearly £5 billion in the first three months of this year, their best performance in over a decade. But the government has ruled out a one-off tax. Our climate change correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, reports. As prices rise at the pump, so do profits for oil and gas companies. BP announcing a bumper first quarter, reigniting calls for a windfall tax to help with the growing cost of living crisis. But the Prime Minister is resisting, concerned that easing pain today could cause problems tomorrow. If you put a uh, a windfall tax on uh, on the energy companies. What that means is that uh, you discourage them from making the investments that we want to see that will, in the end, keep energy prices lower for everybody. BP's CEO unsurprisingly agrees. The message he's pushing, it's not just investments in renewable energy on the line. These are profits that are then rewarding our shareholders who, by the way, are not some faceless institutions, but pretty much anyone who has a pension or pays into a pension in the UK is affected by that. It has been an extraordinary period for BP. It lost £19 billion after the war in Ukraine forced it to offload shares in the Russian state oil company Rosneft. But because of high oil and gas prices, underlying profits soared to £4.9 billion in the first quarter of this year, more than double the year before. The company has also promised to invest £18 billion in green and fossil fuel energy in the UK by the end of the decade. This company and others like it often point out that it was just a few years ago they were suffering record losses because of the pandemic and that it's not reasonable to face extra taxation every time they do well. But campaigners and critics say that the fossil fuel industry simply cannot be trusted to do the right thing of its own accord, whether that's investing in clean, green energy or helping ease the financial pressures on ordinary people. That's why Labour wants to take the money now rather than hope for it down the line. A windfall tax only hits those profits that the oil and gas companies didn't expect to make and therefore it doesn't affect their other investments. It's a practical way to help millions of people with their energy bills. It's Labour's proposal. The government has got no answer. Corporate freedom versus the acute needs of millions being pushed towards fuel poverty. For the government, an uncomfortable balancing act and possibly a moment of political peril. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News in central London. Well, let's get some of the day's other climate news now. And Scotland's Environment Watchdog has asked businesses to save water as they warn that the country could face a shortage this summer. A lack of rainfall over April and March uh, means it was drier than the usual winter, which could lead to water shortages. Now, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency says businesses such as farms should plan ahead to minimise water usage and uh, trickle irrigation on their land to avoid wasting water. Now, thousands of people have evacuated from their homes in New Mexico as the state battles the largest active wildfire in the US. The Calf Canyon fire is moving quickly because of hot, dry and windy conditions and has already scorched almost 50,000 hectares of land. Now, scientists warn wildfires will start earlier and become more frequent as climate change dries out and soil turns to vegetation into kindling. And sea levels in some parts of New Zealand are rising twice as fast as previously thought. 
Climate researchers NZ Sea Rise found that parts of Wellington will see 30 centimetres of sea level rise in just 18 years' time. Now, this would cause typically once in a century floods every year. Globally, sea levels are expected to rise by at least half a metre by 2100. OK, well, an unrelenting heat wave across South Asia has pushed electricity demand to a record high in India in April, and it's led to power cuts across the country and has forced India to import more coal, which powers about three quarters of the country's electricity grid. Now, energy demand has spiked largely because of the need of, for air conditioning to cool a sweltering population. Now, in the long term, experts say heat waves will only become more extreme. So how can more than a billion people adapt to those difficult conditions? Well, uh, Rika Koshla is research director of Oxford University's India Centre for Sustainable Development, and she is an expert in cooling. Thanks so much for joining us. So my first question, Radhika, is how do you go about cooling down a billion people that doesn't rely on fossil fuels? Yeah, thanks. So building energy solutions are not only based on fossil fuels. There's a long history of being able to cool bodies and the built environment using what are called passive cooling measures. These are usually deeply integrated into the built environment. So, for instance, the, the use of heat protection or shading, heat modulation or having thick buildings, um, and then heat dissipation, for instance, using natural ventilation, using evaporative cooling. These are all mechanisms that have been within cultures and different geographies for a long time. And lifestyles are also an important part of how one can keep cool without using an air conditioner, of course, depending on the severity of the heat. I suppose, Radhika, people will say those traditional methods of trying to cool down, so starting meetings and working early in the morning, um, using even headscarves. I know in the north of India, headscarves are, are a big thing because it takes the heat out of the body. But these traditional methods have their limits. That's right. These traditional methods do have their limits, and that is why having active cooling alongside, which the dominant technology for is the vapor compression based air conditioner. So that's the air conditioner that, you know, is in most homes and offices, does need to be used when there is extreme heat. But air conditioners can also be run at their optimal um, level, which is not the case right now. So, for instance, the energy efficiency of an air conditioner can be of the highest available standard in the market. Right now, most air conditioners that are being used are not even at half the level of energy efficiency that they could be. And similarly, the refrigerants that air conditioners use can be of, um, of, of, a, of a manner that has the least greenhouse gas potential than a lot of the current refrigerants that are being used. I had a friend who told me that the heat conditions in Delhi are unbearable and that means not even taking a walk without being in a car with air conditioning on. Those are climate issues that are playing out, aren't they? How do you think India really needs to adapt and how soon do they have to make those changes? Well, it's a multi-pronged strategy. Um, air conditioning is here to stay because it is the dominant technology and therefore the electricity that is supplying that air conditioning load needs to be renewable based. Um, the refrigerants that air conditioners use need to be of low greenhouse gas potential and passive design measures do need to be integrated into the built environment. There is a lot of construction that is still taking place in India, passive cooling measures could be integrated into that, ensuring ventilation, ensuring shading, ensuring access to green public spaces and water spaces. It has to be a combination of these different strategies, both using active cooling energy and using passive measures. OK, Rika Koshla, thank you very much for joining us on The Daily Climate Show. Well, stopping climate change is all about reducing emissions. And the search for solutions is becoming ever more creative with livestock responsible for up to 14% of global emissions of methane, the most potent greenhouse gas. One company has come up with an innovative, if somewhat bizarre, solution. Take a look. The inspiration behind our product came from understanding how big of a problem livestock meat and emissions were. A 
and also understanding the enormous impact that reducing emissions in, in the cattle industry, and particularly methane emissions, could have uh, for our future and for our planet. I grew up sharing a lot of time on my family farm in the outskirts of the Argentinian Pampas, um, but later pursued a, a career in design technologies. So my background to tackle this particular challenge was, was quite unique. The way that we reduce emissions uh, from cattle is through a wearable device. And essentially what the technology does is it captures the methane that the animals emit. About 95% of the methane that the animals emit is coming from their nostrils. So what we do is with this product um, that is a smart cattle harness, we collect the methane that the animal emits from the nostrils uh, and we convert it into carbon dioxide and water vapor, which is a process called oxidation that greatly reduces the global warming potential of methane emissions. So it can have a tremendous impact on the warming capacity of methane as a greenhouse gas. Do stay with us coming up. I'll be joined by lecturer in international relations at Cardiff University, Jen Allen, and director of the Conservatives Environment Network, Sam Hall. We'll be discussing the pros and cons of a windfall tax and whether rising sea levels in New Zealand might help in the search for solutions elsewhere. Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Uh, let's get straight to discussing some of those climate issues with a lecturer in international relations at Cardiff University, Jen Allen, and Sam Hall, director of the Conservative Environment Group. Hello to both of you. So the first question then, BP's record profits in the first three months of this year have led to renewed calls for a windfall tax on the massive profits made by oil and gas companies. It's an emotive subject, especially when consumers are facing rocketing bills. Uh, Jen, let's start with you. Why do you support a windfall tax? There's a long-standing historic role for governments to protect people from the volatilities of markets. Uh, this goes back since before World War I. And so this is the clearest case we've seen of international market volatility affecting people in their homes in a profound, sharp way since, well, probably at least this generation. So there's a clear call, there's a clear rule for the government to protect people from when markets change because of nothing that anyone did. You know, BP and oil companies, this isn't the result of their investments, it's not the result of any innovations. This money simply landed on their doorstep because Putin invaded Ukraine. So there's a clear case here to help protect people from the implications of the war in Ukraine. Uh, Sam, what would you say to uh, introducing a windfall tax then? Well, I'm sceptical in, in principle of a, of a windfall tax. Um, and the main reason is that the transition to net zero is going to be very capital intensive. We're going to need to massively scale up our wind, our solar, our green hydrogen production in order to meet our climate targets. And that's going to require a lot of private sector investment. And to unlock that investment at lowest possible cost of capital, we need policy and investor stability. And I fear that a windfall tax will deter that investment, create an uncertain and unstable regulatory environment for energy companies. Now, I would acknowledge that um, these profits uh, are, are very high that we've seen from BP and expect to see from Shell. And so far, we've not yet seen the desired response from them in terms of pledges to increase their investment in clean energy. Um, and I think unless we see in the coming days BP and others uh, increase their plans for renewable investment or at least signal that that's coming, I think the, the political pressure on, on, on the government to introduce such a tax is going to get very hard to resist. Sam, there will be people watching this evening who will be thinking that BP are walking away with profits in excess and they'll be looking at their energy bill that comes in in the few, next few weeks and, and they'll be confused as to why they're not getting more help. What do you think BP and other larger companies should do with their profits then, if not to help customers? 
Well, so I mean, I think there's a, a role for government here to provide additional support for people in fuel poverty to help with the increased costs uh, of energy. And I think the support that's already been set out isn't sufficient, and the government's going to need to look at that again uh, in the upcoming budget in, in the autumn. I also think the government could go further on energy efficiency and to help people insulate their homes, reduce their gas bills, make it cheaper to heat their home. There was some progress on that in the spring statement with a, a cut to VAT to make insulation cheaper. Um, but there's much more to do, particularly for fuel poor households. So I think there's a definitely a role for government in making more support available to people to manage this cost. I think the key challenge for uh, oil and gas companies and energy companies more generally is getting on with building cheap, clean energy projects. You know, we know that the, the cause of higher energy bills is our reliance on gas. We need to transition quickly away from gas, get more cheap onshore renewables onto the grid sooner. And I think that's where oil, oil and gas companies can really play a role is in investing in those cheap, clean solutions. Jen, is that good enough? Well, I think it's everything that we do need. We do need more energy efficiency. We do need to support people to insulate their homes. We need the cheapest form of energy to be dominating our grid, and that's wind. We need all of those things, but right now there's an obvious way to pay for it, and that is a short, unprecedented, once-in-a-generation type of intervention. And the windfall tax can do that. It's not a long-term solution but it can help fund what we're looking to fund and it can help protect people from the market right now. Uh, people are looking at their energy bills and they're worried what will happen in the autumn when the temperatures aren't quite as nice as we're seeing now. So I think we need to seriously look at this option because their future investments, that 18 billion that BP has promised, that's in the budget, that's already spent. So a windfall tax won't affect that investment in the future, um, but not acting does send a signal that they can continue to earn money off the backs of the poor. Uh, Sam, is it a case of not rocking the boat when it comes to this windfall tax, making sure that those oil companies uh, feel safe to operate here in the UK? Well, I'd agree that uh, it's very unlikely that we'd see a scaling back of investment plans if there was to be a windfall tax, um, as, as the CEO of BP's confirmed today. I think the, the question for me is, uh, are we going to see further ambition on uh, clean energy investments? And as I say, I hope that oil companies will react to the political pressure that, that we're seeing now for this windfall tax and voluntarily choose to make those investments uh, in order to unlock the, the cheap clean energy that we need. I think so a, a final point in this is that I think the UK really wants to be a global leader in this green industrial revolution. We want to be the most attractive place for companies to invest, to create jobs and so on. And I, I fear that having uh, this sort of uh, one-off tax, uh, which is not predictable, uh, which wasn't uh, planned in advance, could deter that investment, make us a less attractive place to invest. And I think we'll only get popular support for this agenda if we make the UK a really attractive place for energy investors. OK, Sam, Jen, stay with us. Uh, more to come on that story, but we're moving on uh, to another subject. Uh, and when we think of countries threatened from rising seas, we often imagine, don't we, small South Pacific islands with few resources. But news this week that sea levels are rising faster than expected in New Zealand means that that country will need to put serious adaptation plans into place and fast. Um, Sam, I'll start with you. Is this a wake-up call for New Zealand? Because, as I said, we often think about those small, far-off Pacific islands uh, having this problem. I think it is a wake-up call for New Zealand and indeed for other uh, wealthier, uh, richer countries about the, the imminent threats of, of climate change. When it's talked about in the media, often climate change is seen as this potential thing that's predicted by models, thing that's going to happen to us in the future rather than now and something that happens elsewhere in other places in, in more vulnerable countries like those small Pacific islands you mentioned. And I think this, this story, uh, you know, we can read across to the UK where we know that coastal communities in, uh, on the east coast and south coast of England and elsewhere are also going to face rising sea levels. Uh, and, you know, I think we are, are well behind on our adaptation planning. It gets less emphasis than, than the mitigation side. Uh, and I think uh, hopefully this is a wake up call that we need to do more in terms of sea defences, natural solutions like uh, coastal realignments as well, in order to make sure we're prepared for the climate change that is already baked in. Um, OK, Sam, indeed. Uh, Jen, I guess what it shows us, doesn't it, is that nobody, no country, no nation is immune from climate change, least of all New Zealand. 
Yeah, climate change, it's here, it's now, it's happening, and no one is immune. Uh, what varies is that some countries will be able, better able to adapt than other countries. So small island states, developing countries, they're already facing the effects of a warmer world, whether it's droughts or floods or sea level rise. They can't adapt in the same ways or build their resilience in the same ways that New Zealand will be able to. And so the solutions that New Zealand comes up with, the solutions that the UK comes up with, uh, you know, in Wales, we're already looking at sea level rise around Aberystwyth. So what we can do as the luckier countries, essentially, that can start to look at this adaptation is figure out how we can scale that up and how we can help other countries in a meaningful way to adapt to the climate change that they're already experiencing. Sam, Jen makes a really good point there, doesn't she, that this situation in New Zealand will potentially help the world have solutions to dealing with rising sea levels. And I guess it has implications for here in the UK because there are various reports, aren't there, from climate scientists that say rising sea levels across uh, the British coast could see flooding in 2030. Absolutely. I think there's a, um, a huge opportunity for um, developed nations to develop some of the solutions and to be able to export them. I think there's also a need for developed nations to deliver on their climate finance promises as well and to help developing countries with less access to, to finance uh, to, uh, to invest in some of these solutions. And I think that's you know, so going to be a big focus in, uh, in Egypt of COP27. Um, I mean, in terms of the UK and our, and our uh, adaptation planning, I think there's a, a lot... Um, uh, more that we need to do. I think if you look at the, uh, the the government focus that you get, I think you see much bigger focus on mitigation. There's a whole climate change minister within Bayes, uh, whereas climate adaptation is a small bit of someone's brief within DEFRA. You get twice, uh, you get a report every year on mitigation from the Climate Change Committee and government response. It's only once every two years on adaptation. Um, so, you know, across government, I think there needs to be much more focus on this. And I think similarly also from climate campaigners and the climate movement, uh, um, who I think often focus on mitigation because, you know, they want to try and uh, see as little climate change as possible and, and fear that a focus on adaptation lets people off the hook on mitigation. I think the reality is we need to do both uh, urgently uh, and we can't, we can't ignore either. I can see that Jen's nodding in agreement there. Uh, we'll end this discussion here. Jen and Sam, thank you very much for your insights today. Well, that's all from us for now, but do stay with us because coming up, Common Ground, Trevor Phillips and his guests will discuss whether it's right that Russian players should be banned from Wimbledon. <laughs>